I think that a prime time for initiation is much more appropriate in midlife. That's when men tend to put themselves into a crisis in order to take a look at who they are, to seek uh, a sense of, of identity or um, re-exploration of where they're going in their life. If you don't do what Robert Bly referred to as Ash's work, which is do your own soul searching, then typically what will happen is you will allow the inflation of your ego to define who you are. Boys will be uh, very competitive. When they're a little bit older, they will turn their attention to conquests, how many uh, successful encounters they have had uh, with women. And then they get into the business world. Perhaps they climb that ladder only to get to the top to realize that it's leaning against someone else's wall. That's all false masculinity because Authentic masculinity is based on men being able to access their souls, their psyches, to reprioritize their lives, to know what's truly important. It's through the ability to relate. When we talk about being spiritual warriors, we talk about men who have come to understand what their destiny is, to know why they're here and what difference that they can make in the world. The reason that we call this a sacred retreat is because <clears throat> we honor you men, the spirit that you bring here, the energy that you bring here. It is a non-denominational retreat. It's ecumenical in nature, meaning that it has a certain spiritual quality to it, and yet we don't uh, walk any one particular religious or spiritual path. We hold a space for you to be able to become your personal best on this mountain for this four-day period and to be able to carry that down the mountain and to activate that in your life. This will be a life-changing, a life-transforming experience for you that will make a difference in the way that you walk on your path when you are down the mountain and in, in your day-to-day -day life. So there's a few things we want to talk about before we adjourn for the evening. <clears throat> we have a policy up here at the camp about snoring. <laughs> we know that, that snorers are sort of comforted by being with other snorers. <laughs> <laughs> there's a kind of soothing sonata that takes place all night long. That, so if you know, for instance, that you are a snorer, then you might want to either bunk in cabin 11 or sleep out under the stars or in your car. <laughs> it's, your, it's your choice. Now, here's the deal. What a good team you guys are. Right. You got Come on, ladies. Where are you? Yeah. Yeah. Steven, do you have a dream or a goal that you'd like to share with the group? My goal is to uh, take the sacred path, the work that we're doing, out into the world. To take it beyond the mountain to other mountains. What are some resources that are going to help you do that? All of the men. All the men. Yeah. You know, when I was growing up, my father was a perfectionist, so I always felt like I had to do things perfectly in order to uh, get his approval or get his love. And what I've come to learn is that I don't have to do it perfectly. I just need to be willing to try, just to do it. And with the support of the men, whatever, whatever happens, I feel good about myself. It's real interesting being the head of a community because you know the, the 
voice inside me says, hey, you're supposed to do everything. You're the head of a community. You know? That's perfect, too. you got to do it perfect. But that, that, that voice, that voice is, isn't, uh, it, it doesn't plague me. It doesn't rule me anymore because it's just the love of a man. It's just the acceptance. And it's whatever you do, it's just going for it. You know? But it helps with me. It, it helps, <laughs> but yeah, it does help to have well, made it. No it, feels, it feels good. Yeah. Oh, really, really glad oh boy. <laughs> awesome work. We do this as men that are on a sacred path, that are working with an American Native tradition for healing and purification. And so we go into detoxify and to pray and to receive. It's fun in there at times and it's serious in there at times. And uh, it can take you to your edge so that you can really find out who you are and find out who you're not. So you can let go of what you don't need to carry and you can pick up what's yours to, uh, to carry with you. My mother's father, Stu, was really my first mentor because he had had two daughters. He had always wanted to have a son, and so along came his grandson. And he and I would hang out together, and he taught me to ride a horse. He taught me to fish, and uh, he was somebody I could talk to. And I always felt unconditional love from him. I think it's a special relationship between grandfathers and grandsons. When a man gets older and that grandfather energy moves into him, he starts to realize uh, and reprioritize, but what's really truly important is not having to work as hard or perhaps he's retired at that point. And so his energies go more into relationship. My hope and desire, my intention, my wish, is that what men will want to do is to give back and to help our youth, to help our children, to help our boys, to be there to assist them, to mentor them, to learn what it means to be a good father. You young fellas are the future of our world. Where we go as a world ultimately depends on where you take us. You had asked me about a special moment between my father and me, and as I was heading out of the house this morning, I looked over at the piano and I saw this picture of my father and me that was taken in 1979 on the, uh, the day that uh, I got married. And I think it shows the tenderness and the sweetness of my father. He gave this to me. It was during the time that he was battling lung cancer. And he said, I thought you might like to have this. He was very frail at that point and had lost so much weight and was very thin. And he pushed himself up and walked into the other room and came back with a paper bag. And in that bag were uh, baseballs. And they were autographed. And Bob Feller and Ty Cobb and, and looked at me and he said, Isn't that something? He said, My dad got all of these autographs for me. And that's what he wanted me to have. To remember him. My wife, our son Derek, and our 18-year-old daughter, Dana. Her boyfriend Taylor and I were en route to Ojai for our 19-year-old son Ian's graduation. He had had a difficult several years, and we knew how important this day was for him. Then my cell phone rang. I kept it close by so that my mother could reach me if there was a change for the worse in my father's condition. It was my mother. Honey, it's your dad. I think you better come now. I think he's going. My heart sank. I told her that we, that we were 20 minutes from arrival at Ian's school and that I would drop the others off and head back to their house. 
My thoughts focused on my desire to be with my father during his passing, while not wanting to disappoint Ian by not being there for him. The phone rang again, and it was Timothy Aguilar, a close friend. He asked a poignant and centering question, what would your father want? Tearfully, I told my mother to tell dad that I loved him. It was hard to stay focused on the ceremony at first. There were so many thoughts that were crossing the screen of my mind. In one scene, we were building a fence together when I was very young, and he was teaching me. <sighs> he was teaching me to use a hammer. Then another scene pushed this one aside. I was a teenager, and my father and I were on the roof. We were fixing the television antenna. Remember those? <laughs> That required my having to lean out over the edge of the roof to hammer a support in place. He was holding me by the scruff of my shirt so that I had the leverage to stretch out a little further. With his other hand, he was holding the nail while I was steadying myself with my left hand and aiming the hammer at its designated target. <laughs> what made matters worse was his admonition that should I happen to miss the nail and make contact with any part of his hand, he might be forced to let go with the other hand, <laughs> allowing me to take flight and plummet to the ground. Fortunately, I hit the nail on the head. We held the funeral for my father at Forest Lawn. I was able to contain my tears until the end of the eulogy. When I sat down, Ian rose and walked to the pulpit. He just spoke from his heart. I knew that Grandpa would be so proud of him and pleased that Ian wanted to speak at his funeral. That evening, Ian took me aside. He spoke low and swallowed hard. Is it true, Dad, that you knew about Grandpa the morning of my graduation, but you made the decision to be there for me? As tears filled our eyes, he put his arms around me and said, I'll never forget this, Dad. Thank you so much. And I could sense my father smiling down on us. That's one of those major turning points in a son's and a father's life that I will never, ever forget either, Ian. I hope. Thank you. to be compassionate and care about other people and that's I think truly the difference that uh, we're going to see I think we're, we're on the verge of a spiritual renaissance of a reformation of consciousness of where you're going to start start to see a lot more people stepping forward to reach out to people who need assistance and support that's what I think it means to be a good man is to be, how caring are you with regards to other people?